morning and greetings, everybody. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of math tonight. So this is, uh, I'm not going to talk about the the sort of the technical side of, of artificial intelligence or machine learning, but I will talk about the specific uh, you know, achievements and and some of the, uh, the the intersections between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and large language models and amateur radio. So, can you promise me you're safe to use? Uh, and the answer is, I'm sorry, Dan, I can't do that. So about me, I'm a Braxis 3D on LinkedIn, so you can look at my uh, technical. Uh, profile there, uh, professional credentials, and, and check them out and see what I am up to and get in touch with me uh, pretty much anywhere uh, as a Braxis 3D. So artificial life and artificial intelligence that's been around for a really long time. And in some uh, histories of this, you, you, it'll claim all the way back 3,000 years ago, but definitely 200 BC and a fellow named Hero hero of Alexandria, uh, made automatons or was interested in automaton theory. These are automated things that can serve a purpose or, or, or and have some adaptability. He also invented the first vending machine, uh, Pygmalion, which is a, a myth. Uh, it's a story. It's also been turned more recently into movies and plays. And this is about a sculptor who creates a, a sculpture, uh, and it comes to life uh, through uh, there's just the, the sheer force of will or, or what we now call cathexis. So this idea of creating something and it having a life of its own because you put your heart and soul into it, uh, 2,000 years old. Al Jazari uh, made, he made human machines, human-shaped machines in 1150. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, made a human robot in 1490. There was a very interesting artificial duck exhibited uh, all over Europe in 1735. It did things like eat. It ground up food and pooped it out and wandered around. And they exhibited it until it wore out. Uh, the movie Metropolis in 1927 is a movie about artificial life and artificial intelligence. And it was colorized. The uh, black and white version was turned into a color version using a machine learning technique called generative adversarial networks. Uh, which is really good at doing things like creating uh, believable uh, color maps and uh, you know colorizing things, and also making believable-looking human faces. So GANs, G-A-Ns, are used uh, in all all over the place in the products that we're using now to make art quickly or to make um, what what we're calling deep fakes. So automatons, the idea of like a robot that does things for you that's that automatic that has some intelligence that's able to look at its environment and make decisions based on the environment. This got really popular in the 1940s. 1970s through the 1980s, we started hearing a lot more about something called artificial intelligence, the rise of computers and distributed you know, th throughout all the world. It's not just a couple of mainframes, but now people had access to computers. We had this idea of developing computer science, the study of computer programming. Uh, and these abstract concepts of artificial intelligence started to get a lot more systematic. And we started to think about things apart from an embodiment. So all the way back 2000 years ago, it was always kind of assumed that the intelligence would kind of arise out of an automated robot human. This changed um, in our you know, living memory to the, the intelligence is something that you can possibly code or uh, or symbolize uh, or create. Now, after a lot of, this was many years of, of a lot of activity, lots of books, lots of attempts. Uh, I think this is the era where you have the computer program Eliza, which is an interactive text-based thing. Um, you know, and, and also we have the concept of the Turing test. If you can't tell that you're talking to a human or a computer program, if it passes the Turing test, that's kind of a big deal. After the 1980s, there was kind of a, a dry spell. There was a drought in artificial intelligence. People, and some people, declared that it was impossible. Uh, they kind of gave up on it. Um, and the, the people, you know, went and did other things. This changed in uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Artificial intelligence was revived. But we had gone, we have, we'd had a transition from 
pure computer science approach to much more of a pragmatic kind of computer programming approach. And we started seeing things called machine learning rather than artificial intelligence. We're, we're now going to change the name slightly and we're going to focus on practical results with pattern matching. So when you see machine learning, that's that's a, a sort of the practical application of, of artificial intelligence. And now artificial intelligence kind of stands for the computer science side of things, more theory, uh, abstract concepts, um, tests, rubrics, those sorts of things. And then the machine learning uh, and large, large language models, which are recent um, sort of invention, we, we, we see a lot of, of activity and a lot of press about that. So this is what we're kind of dealing with when we say artificial intelligence. It's not totally new. This has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. We've always had this going on uh, as long as we've had any intelligence. We, we've been tempted to try to create it, control it, and use it. So what is AI? What is ML? What are LLMs? So AI, computer science, machine learning, deep learning, those sorts of things. These are computer programming. So we apply the engineering. Of, you know, We take the science, we apply it, that's engineering. And the large language models, are these are particular types of ML or machine learning. These are things that that have been models that have been trained on an enormous amount of text. And they predict what the next word should be. And it's hauntingly accurate to English because if you train it on a huge amount of, of uh, text, uh, the, you know, the entirety of a gigantic library, and then you ask it a question, you are, you're pretty likely to get a, a, a result that will at least look like English. Now, is it going to be right? all the time? No. Um, and does it? Is it problematic? Well, yes. But there are some very practical uses for this, and it's not going to go away. So we should be aware of the technology and, and how it can be used and how it can be misused. In amateur radio, we've used machine learning in a number of ways. And so this next part, I'm going to go through a couple of case studies for, for different types of things, like what, what exactly have we done? And um, this one you can you can hear all about in a, in a Rat Pack talk called Who We Are uh, that I did, I think, about 18 months ago now. So what I did is I used machine learning to derive additional information about amateur radio licensees from the ULS database. Now, at one time in the past, we did have age information in in the FCC database because our birth dates used to be part of the record. It's been a very long time since that has been the case. So that information's pretty old. The current um, ULS records don't have your race, your sex, or your age. So how do we get that sort of information? How do we get an estimate um, of that information when we just simply don't have it? Well, you can use different techniques. And so for, for race, to find out what the racial makeup of all the amateur radio licensees is, you use a technique called clustering. So based on which zip code you, your address is in, I can make a reasonable guess about what your race might be. Now, when it comes down to whether you're male or female, we use a machine learning uh, model. And this model was trained on huge numbers of names. And it was taught this name is a male name, usually. You know, it's either almost always a male name, always almost a female name, or uh, might, might be either one, like Lee. Uh, is uh, is kind of a, a toss up, uh, or it may be the case that 25% of people with this particular name, like Ashley, are, are male, and 75% chance it's a, a woman. And so I used a machine learning database in order to estimate the the whether male female uh, for for licensees. And then there was another good study done. Um, on age. Uh, now, specifically, this was about CW contesting and uh, and SSB contesting, but it, and it used surveys and some other uh, pattern matching. So that's one example of how of machine learning in amateur radio. So there's some practical applications that are really kind of cool of large language models. So like ChatGPT, uh, interactive, usually text based. Usually, you're typing away, and you you get a, an answer. Um, and this one's pretty cool. So for 
being on the radio, we speak usually into the radio, uh, you know, voice modes, hugely popular. And text to speech is uh, something that, that large language models are actually very good at and becoming better at every day. So Jerry Hall, W1VE, uh, this is something that he posted to Facebook just a little while ago, just a couple of days ago. He says, there's an artificial intelligence for text to speech that uses your voice. And it's uh, one of the sites that does this is called 11labs.io. So what he did is he dove right in and he generated his voice with uh, a training paragraph. And if you've ever contested and used a recording of yourself on your radio to kind of save your voice, this is sort of like that, but it's also, it's more adaptive. It's a, it's adaptable. It can do more than just play back a recording. It can adapt to maybe what you're logging. Um, and Jerry is interested in writing or using an API. Uh, and other people are interested in this as well, but using an API with the radio to kind of like pull your voice in and and transmit it over the air. So he got a comment from Jamie Dupree who said, hey, I'm using my 11 labs voice as me for podcasts and to fill in new files for recorded contest voice files. And if you worked him in these contests, the call signs were all AI generated. So here's an example of large language models already being used by people today on the air. And then Jerry followed this up a day or so later, and he said, well, the technology is practical, and it is. The text-to-speech is coming right along, and, and you can see that there's an application in amateur radio. Uh, and the current pricing is not. So he, he found out that it would, if he wanted to do it for the whole shebang, it would run about $500. That's kind of pricey. Uh, and then he saw that some were down to 100 and it, it, the prices will fall, but that's the, the current pricing right now for this sort of service. And I was curious about, so SCP kind of stood out to me. It's either secure copy in Linux, or it's a reference to uh, the SCP Foundation, which is a uh, Special Containment Procedures Foundation, which is a fictional sort of uh, organization. Um, and it, the SCP-079, it was an old AI. So I thought to myself, that might be what he's referring to when he said SCP. Or like I said, it could just mean secure copy. So LLMs are arguably the most visible product right now related to AI ML. Um, they're in the news. You can get an account. You can get a free account on ChatGPT and use it for stuff. Bing now has AI in its search engine. All these companies are trying to roll out artificial intelligence and machine learning to make their search better, to, to fill in the blanks. Uh, if you are if you ever log into like a chat program for uh, for customer service, highly likely that you're talking to a, a chat bot that's trained on machine learning. And anything I, having... Oh, go can ahead. Can I interject please. just a second? Sure. Uh, are you familiar at all with SLM, small language models, such as being able to run it on a uh, like an eight, uh, gigabyte Raspberry Pi uh, yes. locally. Yeah, I'm. Are I you going to cover that? Uh, we could talk about that right now because uh, I oh, I don't sweet. really because the 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 really neat thing. Well, the, okay, so there's you you brought up such a good point. There are these smaller language models that you can run on much smaller hardware because right now the large lan language models require an enormous investment and a, a large amount of of processing. And Nvidia right now is essentially printing money by selling, you know, very specialized AI chips uh, and all the big companies are, are getting in on it. And this has made it extremely difficult for smaller companies and for competition to get in there. However, there is another method and you can have smaller models that are distributed. You can either do this through something called federated learning, which allows you to use either your phone or something even simpler, like uh, you're talking like a, a, a Raspberry Pi in order to do most of the job. Now, it's not going to be as good as a large language model, but for specific cases, like there, it's very highly formalized sort of exchanges in like amateur radio. Do well, you don't the, need like a full model for that. Okay, go ahead. please go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I know you're on a roll there, but this no, was no, a go ahead. particular interest to hams. Um, 
I was watching a, a YouTube video on a guy that was configuring eight gig Raspberry Pis using an SLM and basically being able to take that with the um, uh, like a, an NVMe SSD drive, putting that in his Faraday, you know, metal trash can with his emergency radios and all that stuff for the purpose. Um, you can load up to about one third of all human knowledge into that. And that way it's not very fast, but you could then have like all of the English language of most of, you know, what we know. So you could have an awful lot of medicine and science and math and all that stuff stored in a Raspberry Pi and protected from like, we know what the sun can do. So I'm, I'm not fear based. I'm not worried about war. I'm only, what's the sun going to do to tomorrow? Right. So if you can have, you know, I, I teach preppers. I'm not a, they call me a closet prepper, but I'm just a, a guy that does solar and I do other interesting things to be self-sufficient. I'm just an engineer. I like to do things that work. Having one of these devices in your emergency kit and being able to, you know, pull up most of humanity's knowledge when you become disconnected from the rest of the world might be a really interesting thing to have. And then be able to reconnect with the world through ham radio seems like a nice pairing of technologies. Go ahead. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Yeah, the the a lot of these services you can see totally depend on they assume that you're connected to the internet, but having either federated learning or a small language model, something that you take with you and is actually with you, that <laughs> is a is an excellent point and is really in the spirit of amateur radio. Oh, and I, I should say that uh, thank you very much for, for Jim who corrected me. The, the SCP is a super check partial, so not a, a contest infrequently. And it's a, so it's a contester's call sign database. That's probably what, what was meant in the, the post. So thanks about that. Uh, and then let's see, Don says he uses multiple large language models generating Arduino code, controlling a servo movements at multiple times. And he had Copilot duke it out with Gemini Pro. That is very cool. And then um, someone says, uh, uh, has a request for Mr. Glauser to put his call sign in his picture. All right, that's it for chat. Already done. Oh, thank you. So we've already heard from success about uh, writing with, with Copilot. It's been mentioned now twice. Um, and Copilot is something that you can find, you can find it in, it's both GitHub and also in, um, Visual, Visual Studio, right? I use it in Visual Studio Code, which is the free version of Visual Studio. Okay, yeah, and that for for those that that aren't familiar with Visual Studio Code (VSC), this is a an IDE or an integrated development environment for writing uh, software, and it has plugins that support a, an enormous array of customizations and activity for writing code. So if you're not familiar with it, check it out. And it has uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning support for you. And this this ranges from uh, just getting help with the syntax because it can be really difficult to remember all the details of how to use the functions and how to set up you know, the, the code and you know, all of that sort of thing. And then uh, all the way to actually suggesting uh, code for you, so you can you can use it in a bunch of different ways, and it kind of depends on the language as to how much you can get away with. So, these large language models and machine language support for writing software can be hit or miss. So, if you have a a, a programming language that the there's a lot of of examples out there to train on, and the type of code that you're writing is fairly constrained, um, like dashboards, for instance. So anything that's a user interface that's a nice, pretty dashboard, there's a lot of repetition. These are these become kind of chores for you to do as a, as a designer. It's so nice to just sit down and say, describe, you know, do write what we would call as a prompt. So that you would 
you would write this up and you would say, okay, I want a dashboard that has five things and they're each going to do this sort of thing and they're all going to be uh, arranged horizontally, for instance, and kapow. And in a lot of cases, something like that will work. Uh, JavaScript, some Python, HTML, there's there's a whole lot of Python to train on, so the models tend to be pretty good. This can produce excellent results and save time. It, you really have to kind of check it, though. Don't don't assume that it's going to be great every time. And it breaks down to like how much training data is available for that particular programming language or that particular domain, and what tools are available to leverage the LLMs, and whether or not you're using this to write code or you're using it as a, mainly as a syntax assist. So an example where large language models and, and software writing assistance didn't work for amateur radio uh, very well uh, was on one of the projects at Open Research Institute. The language was VHDL, um, which is a hardware descriptive language. And this was a relatively simple task to do a COBS uh, decoder, C-O-B-S. It's a type of serial decoder. And it was not helpful. And there's reasons for that. Um, it did do an initial structure based on the COBS protocol. So there was some help there. It gave a, a rough outline of, of all the different things that you would need in terms of input output ports. That's it. That's that's what it was able to achieve. And the reason is, is that you need a lot of training data. It's all about the data for machine learning. And there is simply not enough HDL published in the open uh, out there in order to to get this uh, done. Over time, this sort of thing will get better, but you need to have enough data in order to produce uh, good results. We also noticed that some of the assertions were made very confidently and they were very wrong. So that was we, so kind of like a, a buyer beware. So there is a dark side to the large language models and machine learning, and it's it has to do with theft, especially when it comes to art and uh, in, in, art and music. Uh, it's stolen, it's scraped. And there is a lot of discussion and a lot of potential regulation that may happen uh, in the long run because of the way that, that these were made. Um, there is bias, so especially with the written word so you can see that there is, uh, you can see evidence of bias and lots of discussion about how to uh, counteract it. There's been several models uh, that have been launched and then had to be pulled back uh, because they said things that were atrocious. So these are, this is kind of the dark side of it. And this is going to take a lot of work in order to, to iron these things out. When it comes to machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer vision, like especially automated driving, the liability issues are are not worked out yet. Uh, who do you sue if you get hit by a self-driving car? There are very concentrated profits right now. So there's a couple of companies, they're raking in billions of dollars, and it's extremely difficult to compete against them, especially if they've amassed a gigantic model with all the data. Uh, what do you do to compete against that? If you can't train on that same data to even catch up, what exactly do you do? Do we settle for a monopoly in, in these areas? And there's also concentrated capability, which is closely related. If all of the people working on this work at just a few companies, well, then how how is the rest of the economy uh, going to keep up? What What do you do? When it comes to social media and and you know, the, the a lot of people like on Facebook, especially refer to the algorithm that delivers you ads, that delivers you suggested things, suggested videos on YouTube. All of these things are now using machine learning and and artificial intelligence. And there's at least two studies: the Faktabari study and a Stanford University study. And it finds that the it, no matter how you deploy these machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms, what ends up happening is that there's a funneling effect. So as soon as you use them and you say, okay, algorithm, I want to deliver ads better to people. I want to deliver things to people in a more predictable manner. Uh, what it does is it it cause, seems to cause uh, extremism. So you, if you're a moderate 
or kind of an unpredictable person, the algorithm doesn't really like you. It would like to train you in order to be either way over here or way over here. And so there's a lot of discussion, um, especially all the way up to the to the in the in, in through the U.S. government uh, about what to do about this. Should artificial intelligence and machine learning be regulated because of this effect? And it isn't up an effect that a company is doing on purpose. This is uh, just it comes out of the math. If you if you have a goal, then and you have a reward then things will happen. And so this is kind of hallmark behavior for recommendation algorithms. So everything from Netflix recommendation algorithm, which has been studied and been around for a while to, to Facebook, to, to YouTube, uh, to Yelp, whatever, it, it really needs you to be predictable. And extremes are predictable and the middle is not. For amateur radio, we have a lot uh, of machine learning and AI in our regulatory future. The way that we have gotten our frequencies allocated uh, for a long time all over the world is much closer to like city planning or real estate or code. You know, we we regulate as if the spectrum is uh, land. So you sort of get a grant to use land in a particular way. Like this place might be zoned commercial, this place might be zoned a university, this place is zoned a national park, and so on. And so, you know, we're familiar with this beautiful map. It really starts to look like a pretty densely packed in city. And uh, you, this, this means that these allocations are kind of fought over, sometimes change, but they're generally static. And so spectrum allocation over over the past, I would say, at least 10 years, there's been a lot of attention at the FCC about something called dynamic spectrum allocation. And dynamic spectrum allocation is one of the working groups of the Technological Advisory Committee. And next week, we start up our new two-year term, and dynamic spectrum allocation is, again, a working group, along with AIML. There's an artificial intelligence machine learning working group as well. So the FCC is looking at this and tracking this, and there's lots of people that want dynamic spectrum allocation. Now, what that means is that the that spectrum is allocated based on changing conditions. So that we can have a spectrum allocation on Sunday that it might be different than one on Monday. The daytime and nighttime might be different, uh, and it it could it kind of breathe and grow and adapt. Now. This means that whoever kind of gets there first and implements functions that can that can deliver uh, actual implemented uh, spectrum allocation on the fly like this will make out. They'll do really well. They can then um, you know move their systems around, charge more money or less money, save lots of money when they're you know if there's not a lot of usage. For for amateur radio, this is kind of a this is a big challenge, but it's also something that we actually have always done. You know to listen before transmitting, right? You're doing dynamic spectrum allocation within within our, our bands all the time. Our radios may not be the sort of, you know, cognitive radios or f the fancy radios or have lots of extra sensors or be able to do uh, the sort of agility that we're talking about for in, in, in spectrum allocation for commercial. But we have this already kind of built in to our to our culture and practice. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is at least as disruptive and important as the transistor for us. Eventually, this will be part of, of, of radios. It'll, it'll be part of our regulatory framework. It will be a big part of our economy. So knowing what's going on and how it can affect us and how we can use it is important. The main deal with the dynamic spectrum allocation, and and at some point, either either we're going to get exempted from that, or we'll have to do it ourselves. Is the is ideas like bandwidth agility, uh, and throughput optimization that your radios are going to be expected to be much more flexible and capable, and that's really kind of the biggest impact over time to us. Economically, we can calculate 
end user costs for things like bandwidth and throughput access. We're talking like in this case, cellular and other commercial services. And it's actually pretty low. The cost like per Hertz is, is not bad. But in the future, the expectation is that end users will most likely be expected to pay more to access bandwidth more efficiently because of the pressures, the regulatory pressures. So AI, AIML also lets regulators raise expectations on our receivers as well as our transmitters. And for amateur radio, that is kind of a new thing. Our transmitters are the things that are regulated and get all the attention and that we pay the most attention to. Where are you transmitting is super important. And our, But anybody can use pretty much any receiver. So the idea of regulating receivers is gaining momentum. And this is, like I said, something that would be kind of new for us. Other places that machine learning is going to affect us is things like component design. For example, microwave circuits um, or very complicated RF circuits that humans don't, we just wanna, we wanna fill up a catalog with a couple of choices that cover most of the major bands and work pretty well for most applications. Machine learning lets you really amp that up. So components getting better, more specific, more flexible, that's happening now and it will continue to happen and we will start seeing th these show up in products. Uh, network operations, being able to do things that that humans cannot configure, uh, that's, that's an effect that we will see. Uh, this raises more machine learning and more AI means more technical debt. If you're expected to have a very complicated radio that, that can coordinate with other radios over the air, um, that that causes a, a pretty big gap. So we should look out for places where technical debt might happen. Uh, automated regulation, that, that, is, that is something that the FCC would really like to, to be able to do more of. They would really love to automate some of these regulatory functions and, um, and just let AI take care of it. There is bias in the data the machine learning algorithm and the results are only as good as the data that goes in. If you remember the garbage in, garbage out statement from computer, you know, from computer science and from computer practice, we got the same situation here. And there's never enough data, especially for wireless uh, communications. There is no company, even the ones that are doing lots of AI ML work that has enough data that has enough spectrum measurements, that has enough radio data in order to really get good traction on, on the, the models and, and the results. This is something that we hear over and over again, and it's going to continue to be true because it's just extremely difficult to get enough training data off the air. So us as amateurs, I think that that we need to be aware of, of AI ML's effect on regulatory and technical work so that we can ensure that we can continue to participate in emergency communications for sure. So if it if an agency or if a served agency has to, if they start changing things and using much more AI ML on the air and you want to continue to support emergency communications and public service, then we are gonna have to move with it and, and train with it, understand it. Um, we're going to have to do a, a good job of quantifying and qualifying. So like we we may be expected over time to actually report uh, to defend our spectrum instead of just saying we use it, we have to prove that we use it. We're gonna be expected to, to come up with some measurements or some metrics. That's really pretty difficult to do. Um, on HF, you can set up a listening stations and you can see web SDRs all over the place, but you know, for, for anything that's line of sight or uh, or you happen to be in the wrong place. This is a difficult problem. So this is something to look out for, to kind of keep an eye on. Um, we want to avoid expensive solutions if radios suddenly cost uh, thousands of dollars for, <laughs> you know, like large thousands of dollars, then this, this means fewer people will enjoy. Uh, and it also may start threatening homebrew if you have to design something that's very complicated. And then um, how to learn about AI ML telecommunications. How? Is there a textbook? Not really. Uh, practical curriculum to train amateurs about AI ML to start 
using it and learning it with it with I had had a couple of case studies and I'm sure that that all of you out there have even more good examples um you know hardware software if we could get a lot of these sort of case studies uh gathered up and published and and if we can kind of spread the word then developing a practical curriculum uh isn't really too too far of a of another step and this may be something that that rat pack could could help achieve all right and that's it i'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and then uh, i would love to invite people to comment and to expand on on what we're talking about tonight and share your your victories or setbacks that would be that would be fantastic so you asked me a question as to what is the uh, productivity improvement in my coding using copilot yeah I'd would roughly you, would you I'd like roughly to guess anywhere from 10 percent on a slow day it really does help suggest it it looks at what I've got open, what's in my clipboard, and where I'm at in things, and it will anticipate what I it thinks I'm trying to do. And I can just hit the tab key and just blow through a, a bunch of code that, generally speaking, is pretty close to what I'm actually looking for. So not too bad with having to correct. Other days, it can be as high as 60% where I'm trying to work on a really big problem, and I ask some uh, questions and go through several of the suggestions and pick uh, one that works the best. So there are days when, man, is it worth it to have. On your spectrum um, use for machine learning and, and what we can do in ham radio, the first thing that came to mind to me was like reserve a portion of the six meter band like a megahertz where it's dedicated to all kinds of interesting things having to do with machine learning, um, communications that are specific to this technology, yet still keep legacy bands. Uh, so you get D all of the above, where you've got uh, old Heath kits that can still work and you've got homebrew and because ham radio is designed to be the incubator for technologies. So you can teach the kids using ham radio. You don't need the multi-thousand dollar rigs to just to get on the air. You can build uh, a simple trans, you know, a regenerative receiver and a simple two transistor uh, transmitter and a Morse code key and get on the air. So I, I don't think it would be productive to limit ham radio to the high end, uh, machine learning stuff it would i think it would be fought terribly but i think setting aside a specific section for that research and development would help incubate things oh thank you that's a great point yeah and thank you very much for for giving a a, a solid uh, personal example of uh, of using using this technology to to write software. That's a, a huge area right now, and it's it's not going to go away. It'll it'll continue to to grow and develop. And I get better at at utilizing it too. So there yeah, are days is, when that is true. That's a skill to this. Just like if you know, in anybody that's used a search engine knows that you kind of have to adapt your you know you, you, when you put in a search. There's you, there's an art and a craft to it, and the prompts for AI ML, especially for for coding, uh, it, this is also a skill that you you learn how to how to use it and how to get better results out of it. Okay. And just like you said, the training. I'm sorry. Just like you said, the training information is paramount. So as a senior programmer, I look at the stuff that does, and it's like, no, that's what a junior programmer wrote up that it picked up somewhere. So it does not replace good programmers. It does aid them, but it does not replace them. Okay, shutting up. Well, thank you so much for the the comments. And yeah, uh, Paul, I think you've you've had you have your hand raised. Paul, uh, KD seven ISA. Yes, yes. I'm not one of these uh, engineer types, but I do see so, a little bit of automation 
I use uh, Winlink on HF, and they added something a little while ago where the Winlink tries to tell you approximately if the propagation is good or bad using numbers one to a hundred. So I noticed this about a year ago or less, they added a device in there so I can change the parameters, which is good. And I found out it, it thought I was sending out radio waves at like 15 degrees, but I'm doing NVIS. So I changed it to 75 degrees and I get a little better prediction. It's still pretty lousy. They do have an auto connect thing. And when I first used auto connect, it didn't work. But as I, as I made more connections, sometime, some days it seemed to work really good, and then other days it goes really bad. But I did find out I can go in there and tell it, only use frequencies over this range, maybe because I don't have an antenna for 28 megahertz. And I noticed they're starting to use the signal-to-noise ratio. Vera and Wainlink are communicating more in signal-to-noise ratio. I'd like to take my logs that it generates because it'll give the time of day, it'll give the grid square of the station I'm contacting and the signal to noise ratio. And if we could teach AI uh, what to look for in terms of time of day where I'm at and where the other station is at, what's the relationship to the gray line, that would be so easy to feed all of that data through and have it give me uh, little hints or here's your average, here's what usually happens. Sometimes I can connect to a faraway station on two different bands when you're thinking, hey, it should only connect on one band and, and the other band should either fall short or shoot over the top. That's a and, really good example of, of and now taking... that's something we could do like this year or next year, not 15 years from now. Yeah, that's achievable because the, the those logs are being generated um, all the time. And then there's, there's this opportunity to take um, the ionospheric measurements and and all of the the weathered space weather data, um, and and fuse it in there uh, to have that yeah, part of the correct. model. Like so yeah, that's I a can... really achievable. You've you've outlined here's a very achievable can, thing. Um, connect by HF to a station that's about somewhere between ten or fifteen miles away. But if I notice, I noticed when I was connecting with HF stations, if the weather sounded really gnarly, sometimes I knew. That meant I could contact, I wouldn't fly over the top of a station, I could connect to it. And I actually connected to one in an adjacent county on HF, which was really unusual, but the weather was so gnarly, I think just anything can happen. Uh, thanks. Oh, you're very welcome. That's an excellent example. I think it would be great to follow up on that. Maybe we could we could have a talk and uh, a talk just on that here, here at Rat Pack. That'd be great. Okay, uh, Brian's up here next, but let's Barry, you want to uh, look at the chat and see what's if we're missing anything? Michelle pretty well picked up everything that was in the chat before. So, and I just wanted to mention that Apple has a thing called personal voice where you can actually train it with a 15 minutes of reading all kinds of text. And then you can sit back and tell the computer to speak like you, and you almost can't tell the difference. <laughs> just scary yeah the speech models are extremely good they're they're pretty pretty remarkable let's see there was a comment in the chat of a website rm-noise has a free artificial intelligence app which sends audio from your radio to a remote server which removes pretty much 100 percent of the qrm and qrn so man-made natural interference and it returns clean copy to your computer and uh, with a latency of about 0.3 seconds or so. So noise elimination, noise reduction, this is, an, this is also an area where machine learning has really gotten some traction. Uh, cleaning up audio, removing noise, um, it can really get the hooks in on that. Um, and then someone it's, says- no, It's no. remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable. It's, it's amazing. Um, and there's a, so if you've ever seen um, like an AI ML um, corrected photo, like a very damaged photograph, uh, you know, or an incomplete photograph. So it's same sort of math where it's, it's, it's getting the structure uh, from, from something that's been damaged. And, Would that uh, work with digital protocols? Yes, actually it, it, it absolutely would it it would work with uh 
a waveform over the air is a waveform over the air. So a digital protocol is, uh, you know, sending out sending out waves. The difference between like digital and, and an analog signal, like a say a human voice, single sideband over the air, that you can you're demodding it with your ear, right? Um, is that the uh, digital signal when when it's properly designed is looks very much like noise already. So your digital exactly. signals look like noise and your and your and analog signals traditional analog signals have a much you know they don't look like noise they're, they're very very obvious you can almost actually see the voice uh, in a waterfall display but these techniques uh, to remove noise noise reduction um, you know digital protocols have all sorts of other math to do it but there is some traction that you can get from noise reduction with a digital signal as well you just have less headroom, you know, because it's already it already looks like noise. Someone yeah, said yeah. noise is the language of my people on chat, and I think that's very funny. And yeah, that I got a, a link for Toolpath Labs denoise.ai if anyone is interested. Oh yeah, I think we've spoken about that briefly on Rat Pack before. Um, and then yeah, artificial intelligence is not like it depends. It doesn't. It really wants you <laughs> to be predictable. And that's it. Really excels at that, and it's uh, sort of a, a spooky emergent sort of uh, uh, quality of of the algorithms for for preference. Like if you have a preference, if it can figure out your preferences. Um, and shout out to the TAC. And yes, see you at next week's meeting, Brian. Then uh, Brian says native intelligence is part of the next generation wireless systems and embedding intelligence in the radio access network and open RAN. Yes, so open or RAN, R A N, radio access networks, um, to start leveraging machine learning and and being able to predict, being able to adapt to conditions. Um, a radio access network may have to handle all sorts of different radios, and they may be all configured differently. And you may have an unpredictable radio or a new radio, a new design. And the goal is, is to for these radio access networks to be able to just handle it. I like the quote, noise is the music of some. Yes. Yeah, and prompt engineering is a discipline. So if I'm Jim, that's true. So designing prompts. So for you as a user to be able to quickly get access to the entirety of human knowledge through like a, a large language model, you have to kind of train yourself to to be able to use these things and people on the other side that are designing these models are really trying very hard to figure out how you are prompting them so people are working at it from both sides of of the problem and then let's see if there's any other questions oh there's a comment about winlink from steve waterman so winlink auto connect depends on a government application for propagation prediction however it can be fine-tuned so it sounds like maybe not machine learning yet, but this this would be a good, I would say a good candidate for for maybe some some models that were tuned for like ionospheric propagation. And then um, we, we welcome Bri anyone that wants to do that. Yeah, it's hard, but it would be uh, extremely rewarding. And w with, um, you know, I, there's a growing amount of data about the ionosphere and some really good satellites and satellite feeds. And if for the cost of putting up a dish and um, some hard drives, so you can you can get a lot of information. Uh, so yeah, it's a good opportunity for someone to to dig in and do some hard work. That's uh, so Brian has his hand raised, so you have the floor, Brian. Well, I was just uh, listening to what you're talking about. I'm a senior Linux engineer, and to show you my age, I remember the day working in a cubicle, and when I needed to find the parameter for a command, I just turned around, I bought had to grab a four inch wide binder and look it up. That was back in 1979. But um, part of my job, my company is hiring new engineers that come in, Linux engineers, uh, not to per se Linux as much as training them to our environment and how it works and how, it, how to patch all, all that. But I, so I never, I honestly never touched AI. I didn't care about AI. You know, when I needed to write a script, I never write it from scratch. I'm like everybody else. I go out and find it written somewhere, steal it on the internet and, and, and rewrite it to my needs, which that's, that's not theft. That's just, Hey, that's a compliment to the person that wrote it. But this new young lady that I just hired, um, or I didn't hire that the company hired, 
I brought her on, started training everything, showed her some things. And she said, oh, just use AI for that. She says, what do you mean? And what blew me away is I was writing a script for a platform we're doing, and I could literally just say, write Brett, how did I word it? Write bash script, loop through text file, one line per record, awk fourth field. And I swear the dang thing wrote the code. It would it did not have errors in it. All I had to do is rename the parameters to what I was using, and it worked. And I said, holy, I'm gonna I was gonna say shite, but holy crap. I mean, I, I I'm still I'm from the time when you know you grabbed a piece of paper and looked it up to now. I am I just telling the machine, is it now going out? It's not is it actually writing that or is it? Did I just push it down the line to where it went and found something and copied it? I don't know, but it was spot on. And I've used it three times this week. And I don't know. It's just and, – and what always is a benefit from when I did that, when it wrote that code, it always wrote it in a way that – and you know there's so many ways to do it. And I'm just talking – I'm not a programmer. I am an – I'm a, a Linux engineer that just writes Bash scripts. And good ones, but, you know, that's still sort of programming. But every time I see how AI does it, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how, that's a whole different way of doing it. I've not seen that before. And then I find out there's there was a better way for something else I'd already done. So I don't know. I'm I'm impressed and scared at the same time. So I'll leave it at that. That's a the, that's a very fair way to, to say it, to describe it. It's pretty accurate. It's amazing, and it can be kind of scary. So yeah, if it trains on a huge number of examples of, of utility scripts, and if and we know uh, from years of of um, of pain and misery with with managing computers, we know networking has some design patterns to them. There's patterns the way you do things. There's there's a, there's schools of thought and, and a variety, but the patterns will emerge, and you can you have access to these patterns because the machine learning is excellent at finding the patterns. And the really exciting and scary thing is when it comes up with a way that is not been seen before. And that's why we refer to it as learning, because it, on occasion, when everything lines up right and the data is good and the prompt is good, it will give you a, a what what is a novel result or a more efficient result or a more optimized one. And networking is one of the places where AI ML shines. Now go ahead, Don. Done. Thank Go you. Ahead. So I come at it from the exact opposite perspective. I have no interest in understanding the code exactly zero. But what I am interested in doing is writing some code for all these little Arduino thingies that sort of power the many of our radios are all based around putting code on Arduinos to then control a, a frequency synthesizer, right? And do all the rest of that stuff. So I wanted to see how do we get code on here? How what is that magic? So I started simply just using a um, move a servo at certain times per day. And the software that it generated was lovely. And my goal was to never understand it and to never read it and to never touch it, but to simply copy and paste out of the code base that I got, copy and paste. I would close my eyes so I didn't see it, slam it into the IDE, generate it and run it. And if it ran, then that's it. I was done with it. Um, so how do you feel about being a test engineer for AI? I, I just think it's terrific. And then I would have Google uh, Gemini Pro battle co-pilot. And I would give them the same prompt. And the code was always a little different, which is interesting. And then, of course, the secret to all this is, as Michelle, as you mentioned, it's really um, understanding how to use a prompt. And, and when something's not right, how do you guide this environment you're using to fix the code so I don't have to go look up the error code because I don't want to do that. My goal is to never, ever, ever see the code. And I'm playing in the sweet spot. There's so much training data around Arduinos. You know, I'm basically doing the work that every high school student does who's precocious in software. So there's there's a, an abundance of training code. So in those areas where you got a ton of training code, my God, is it wonderful to work with. Well, my only question is, is whose name do you put on the product when you're done? Yeah. 
Copilot says I have royalty for use of the code. So you're going to put Copilot on it because you haven't vetted it. It's good by me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, still, I didn't anybody have who wants credit. Anybody who wants credit can take credit. <laughs> Well, no, um, but, uh, yeah, the, the whole idea, well, I, I talked briefly about liability and I talked a little bit about, about theft since all of this, uh, all these really large models just simply scraped um, the internet for, for everything. Um, and this is contentious. Uh, and this also kind of leads into um, uh, a question someone asked about, uh, I believe about regulatory uh, and, and at the level of, uh, Let's see, the party presentation discussed algorithms funneling results into, you know, creating extreme uh, views and teaching users to be more like the extremes to make it more predictable. So the question was, what kind of discussions were being had on the regulatory side about that kind of tendency in the algorithms and and what essentially what the regulators are going to do? So this is a very contentious uh, area and the discussions that we've had at the FCC are difficult ones because what it, it which relates to what can the FCC really do about content of communications and authorship which is which is what you're asking about uh, that's a big challenge and it's probably going to take uh, I would I would guess it's going to take some sort of significant amount of, of number of lawsuits uh, somebody is going to have to suffer some sort of harm or try to prove some sort of harm or damages in order to get that sorted out. So in the in the in the meantime, most of these say it's it's yours. Here here it is. You can use it. Um, there's a, a variety of of products that use uh, either pattern matching or or code generation, like HDL Coder from MATLAB, for instance, which will create HDL code from your simulating models. This isn't really AIML, but the code is created from an automated process, and that code is yours to do whatever you want to with. So the thing that you should probably look for is exactly what what he mentioned, and that is you need to look to see what the uh, for the license agreement or what the or what the state of the output is. Like who really owns it? Is it yours free and clear? Then yeah, go ahead, go ahead, you know. But but that's something that that we should look out for. That we should pay attention to um, because yeah, turning it around and publishing it is it is it yours? Did you write it? Um, and there, there will continue to be uh, regulatory and legal uh, questions about this. Um, so that's a. I think this is one of those very central sort of um, contentious aspects of AIML: the liability issues, authorship. Uh, what do you do with the results? Who really owns them? Um, we do have a, a. If you're familiar with like photography, intellectual property cases, copyright cases, there was a case of a, I think it was a monkey that grabbed a, a, a camera, took a picture, and the owner of the camera is, just, is, is basically it's like, okay, well, who who actually ended up taking the, the picture? This went through the court system with some unexpected sort of results uh, that it, basically it has to be a human in order for, for you to have copyright, that a, an animal can't can't have copyright over over a photo. And we may come to to have similar sorts of arguments in, in the in the courts about if it was created by a computer, can the person then claim like copyright if somebody writes a novel and they people have, there's there's lots of AI generated uh, books for sale on Amazon right now. Um, but it, it may come a time where somebody really kind of pushes the issue and there's a, a case where where someone's trying to show harm. When it comes to software, if somebody suffers harm because of software and the author used AI and let something by that otherwise it's argued that they would have caught, is that negligence? So these are questions that we're going to have to start confronting more and more as these AI ML things, and especially in software generation and in hardware generation, as they become more and more common and larger and larger bodies of software are produced. Uh, so all these questions are very relevant and and they're being uh, fought over right now. Is there any um, advantage to writing out the question completely when you ask AI something? I tend to just put in like verbs and nouns. I don't like, does that make any sense what I'm saying? In other words, I don't write it out as like I would be talking to a human. I write it out as 
I'm just using the key words in it in order if I said it, but I leave all the others out. But My I don't know experience with that is that it takes practice. Yeah, it's kind of like its own dialect almost, and and it it can depend on on which system you're talking to. So it's a really good question. Like if you have a a, a body of knowledge, if you're having a specific, a specific question where just a couple of words will suffice to to generate it back, then go with that. There's when when you're trying to get a particular type of artwork, though, like from from some of the the generative uh, sites. And you're trying to generate an image or a video, uh, then it takes a lot more description and it starts to look more like complete sentences up to a paragraph. So the answer to any good question is it depends, and that is the answer that that <laughs> that you're going to yeah, get. So it. Gemini. I was using Gemini, and I've I've found that it's roughly the same. I didn't know if there was a better one than Gemini, but that's just the one I've been using because it's it's free. Yeah, it's really quite amazing to me the the that a lot almost all of these. I mean, you saw the the costs, uh, the current costs for uh, Eleven Labs .io and generating uh, customized voices that can rack up. You can rack up the costs pretty quick, and you can subscribe to uh, better versions of like ChatGPT, like ChatGPT four is a subscription. But there's so much that's available for free. That's really quite remarkable. So anybody with a computer and a connection to the internet can can experiment with this and see uh, what it can do for them. One of the areas that that I think might have start affecting us all uh, is station automation. So all of these automated functions that that we see all around us can be applied to our own stations, and it it is getting easier and easier to to do that. So if there is any way to to be able to automate the you know your to control your radio you're really just one step away from being able to automate your station in ways that um that may make the hobby a lot more fun and it won't appeal to everybody there's things that who cares I don't want to automate that or I love doing this myself and you should absolutely keep doing that and not uh, succumb to to anybody trying to push you into doing it just for the sake of doing it. But there's lots and lots of wonderful automation potentials in in automating our stations and getting a lot more out of the equipment that we have. I think that would be a really great place to have more talks and examples and you know and people showing and telling what they have done. Um, and and that's something I think Rat Pack could could ease, could do. That I'd I'd really like to see more of that. Do yeah. some, come on. One of the things is the computer held my homework hostage, then uploaded to my toaster, which cooked it, and then the dog ate it. <laughs> well, if if you're a teacher or if you know one, ask them how they feel about Chat GPT and and assignments because. Teachers are going through it right now. So, okay, let's pick up Don. Teachers are also using Chat GPT to grade essays. Yes, yeah, that's true. Don, and you Don has his hand away? up again. Michelle. Thank you. I just wanted to add that um, I've gotten into writing my prompts to be a little more procedural, and I hate myself for doing it. But all of my English language requirements are essentially bullet points, so I'm writing like I would write for PowerPoint, and I detest myself for doing it because it's me yielding to what the machine wants, but it makes the code, easy, the code easy for me to go back and modify because I've got every requirement on its own line. But I would tell you all this, be very, very, very polite when you interact with any large language model, because when they are an overlord, our overlord, <laughs> I don't want to be up against the wall. So I always say please and thank you, and I recommend you do the same thing. Better safe than sorry. I think Better that's... safe than sorry. Yeah, very good point. Okay, Dan's up there, California Dan. Well, I've been reading all the comments and listening, and um, I actually had to go look it up. It was 1973, Woody Allen's movie Sleeper predicted the orgasmatron. And you can imagine what that was. But there was actually work being done to create um, assistive intelligence 
experiences by the National Park Service. Because while the mission is to protect and preserve for future generations, future generations are large in number and they play havoc on the environment in a lot of places. So they were hoping to come up with an immersive experience, which of course now you can buy for, you know, 3,500 bucks or so. Um, and the other one was that as we were looking at this, and I couldn't fit, I could not find out who said it first, but clearly bad data will make you sick if you're trying to go for that. So, yeah, the quality and quantity of the data, it's all that's what it's all about. That's the whole game with, with machine learning. And even oh, having a grasp of what goes into it and how finely tuned decision making can become. I'm never going to trust a self-driving car. Yeah, self-driving cars are extremely difficult. This is a really hard, hard problem. And to call it self-driving or autopilot is a blunder, in my opinion. It's an assist. So driver assistant should be what yeah, we look. view it as. And it's a, you know, guess it's an extremely difficult problem. The world is a very messy place. Sensors are not perfect. Um, things just happen. The phrase, just the phrase autopilot. I mean, I never got that far as a pilot, but it, it <laughs> gives me shivers because I don't want it thinking. I want it doing what it's programmed to do. Hard programmed, not not. Yeah, there's an. It, it, you've reminded me of another area in amateur radio um, where we attempted to use some machine learning and it didn't work. And this was uh, satellite pass prediction. Uh, so well, satellite pass prediction is closed loop problem. That's you know it is you can absolutely find out where the satellites are. So it wasn't predicting the satellites. It was predicting who was going to be on that pass based on logs. So what we attempted to do was download all the logs for anybody that's ever worked a satellite that like logbook of the world or, you know, anywhere we could get them. It turns out that there's not enough data to really make a prediction that you end up just re regurgitating back the things that you trained it on. And this is a, this is a problem, a known problem in machine learning, that if you if you don't have enough data, uh, or if you don't have enough diversity of data, that when you ask it a question, you'll always just get the same, you'll get the data repeated back to you. And we saw this happen. So it was like, oh, you know what, I we backed up and then looked at essentially the theory behind the, the machine learning that we were using. And it's just simply not enough information. It's too sparse of a data set. Um, and that was kind of surprising to me because, wow, it looks like a lot of QSOs. So when you when you say uh, large, <laughs> you know, big data, or you say machine learning, or you hear deep learning, then always put a little asterisk on it that it ha the data, the, the, you have to have enough of it, and you have to have uh, good data. So that's that's we found that out firsthand. It was uh, it was not really going to be able to predict anything more um, than just reciting back what had happened, exactly what had happened in the past. So there was no new new predictions, nothing nothing new coming out of it. Yeah, and deep fakes in the news media is just absolutely astonishing. Yep. It's, I almost want to take refuge away from the internet. Yes, it's a, it's a brave new world out there. It will, uh, you know, just we're we're, we're going to be in for for quite a ride for quite a while. Has right. anybody any of the computers to code in machine language? Say again, Barry. Anybody ever trained any of the computers that are currently being programmed using all of the different artificial languages to code in actual machine language? Zeros and ones. Oh, you mean like uh, okay to to produce like a direct to, to directly produce a binary? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, for the most part, because we're because computer programmers really just want help doing the chores, yeah. like the boilerplate. We really don't want to have to write the same crap over and over again. Slightly different for the right. next project, right? I mean, we we want that. So it it tends to train on the the source code 
you know, so language, syntax, the the written stuff, and the compiler handles the rest. And compilers have been optimized over many decades. I wonder if um, there would be uh, another big step forward in optimization if you had applied machine learning to, to compiler design. I don't know, uh, but I think that would be a great thing to look up and, and dig into. Yeah. Excellent question. And there was a point from Brian he in chat, and he said um, that the the military have lo been looking at using AI for propagation propagation forecasting, and lots of work done and presented at Milcom, which is a, a big, very interesting uh, conference, uh, a couple of years back. And there was a deep learning training model based on predictions. So talking about uh, propagation forecasting, which is important. Uh, and this was incorporated, and and uh, it sounds like it was combined with ALE, automatic link enable, to have a, a more robust HF system. So if you're familiar with the, with HF link or ALE, uh, that the propagation prediction is the product of, of deep learning. And then uh, Steve Waterman says that that actually is in, um, I guess they say now reduced to a DLL. Uh, I assume that might mean reduced to a DLL and available in WinLink, or, or maybe we Steve. use the DLL, and it's the propagation prediction results from the right. from ALE. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, propagation from, and, mother, from mother nature. Right on. That's cool. Yeah, smart antennas are another area. So that's a you know adaptive antennas uh, with big reflector arrays, which are very uh, configurable antenna surfaces. Uh, they're called in intelligent surfaces um, that the AIML used for for beam forming and and all sorts of interesting stuff in radar. I mean, there's just all sorts of radio places to to find machine learning and to try things. Interesting a comment by Dennis about the report that came out yesterday in the news media, the State Department noted that AI potentially represents an extinction level threat to humanity. Obviously, you know, where the State Department stands. <laughs> they sound a little grumpy about AI. Yes. But yeah, it's a, like any very powerful tool, um, it can be weaponized and it can, it can hurt and it can help. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, hi Michelle, and and yeah, that I had to chuckle when I saw that on the news yesterday. It was it was like okay, I have to say my background, um, my background goes in in the subject. I won't call it artificial intelligence. I'll say expert systems. I was working with expert systems back in the uh, mid '80s and working at, at Hughes Aircraft and working with the guys at the uh, Hughes Research Lab, uh, Doug Partridge and a few other folks up there. Um, it's interesting that, and I, it's like I try to make the distinction between expert systems and artificial intelligence. Back then, it was real clear. And today, I think a lot of, I wonder if a lot of the things that we call AI really can be referred to as expert systems. You know, the, the, I mean, that's really what we based expert systems on was it's it's learning. It's 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 creating a, uh, a knowledge base, as it were. And my experience was with a tool called the Technology, which was a, what they call a reverse inference engine, which was really a pretty cool system. And we were using that to, um, as an expert system, to supplement uh, or augment uh, what uh, uh, it was a tool to help augment people's knowledge of dealing with uh, repairs and uh, corrective action and that kind of thing based on experience of literally, you know, thousands of, uh, of uh, situations that the, the experts had gone through and you collect all that data. And when you encounter a problem in a system, the reverse, in, the reverse in, inference engine will, re, will take that data and give you a root cause, which is, was kind of cool. It was a fun project that I worked on. So yeah, I'm curious as, as to where that, how that fits in and how that, how you view expert systems versus AI, if you have a, a thought about that. Yeah, um, my my definition or the definition I'm most familiar with for expert systems is a a, a something that can give you a, an answer in a, a particular domain of knowledge. And mm -hmm. the ones I'm most familiar with are diagnostics and, and medicine. So if you have 
yeah. a, you have a set of symptoms and you walk right up to it and you go, you know, okay, so here's the, here's the basically the patient report. Here's their numbers. Here's, here's what I'm asking you. And you get a diagnosis back. Mm -hmm. So it's pattern matching um, or essentially a flow diagram, or like you said, reverse inference. Reverse inference. And, and then the distinction that I make between an expert system and a, maybe a machine learning model is that the, the expert system won't learn that won't update. It's right. supposed to be a right. knowledge base. It's supposed to capture as much as possible and be an expert for mm -hmm. you to consult. But a machine learning model will over time adapt and change out right. from under you, which is yeah. why regulators get so <laughs> get so because uh, who it's unpredictable. Who knows what it will do and how it works is still mostly a mystery. Uh, and if it's if you're sold. A, uh, a machine learning model to to step into your business and to handle aspects of your yeah. business versus your sold an expert system. The expert system is static and it won't change out from underneath you. One day you may wake up and the machine learning model has figured out that if it, if it writes calls and puts on your stock, it can actually make tons of money off on the side. <laughs> and right. is <laughs> right. So you can't really predict. And yeah. the, ex the best example I have is the one for social media algorithms for, for you know, preference for, for returning a preference and for recommendations and the tendency for these models, these machine learning models to adapt to the audience and also try to uh, accomplish the goals of the company. The company wants to sell more ads. The model very quickly figures out that making people that that ha only have they're in two camps that have extreme views and are grumpy at each other is the easiest audience to sell to. So you can see the difference between an expert system, yeah. which may deliver ads in a predictable way and not have this effect, versus something that that does. So this is why regulators and and why yeah. a, lot, a lot of us on this call have sort of a gut level, uh, you know, awareness of like, hmm. You know, <laughs> it, it's it's intelligent, but it's not a person. And right. Right. you know, machine learning uh, algorithms making management decisions is a is a no go. But companies are doing it. You you can't hold a a, a piece of software accountable. It, you can't really fire them. You can turn it off or try. Uh, you know, so that the distinction between an expert system and and deep learning or machine learning or AI to me boils down to the expert system will do what it's taught and give right. you answers and it won't slide out from under you or mu mutate into something Sorry. different over time. That's right. Yeah, you mentioned Eliza uh, as an, I think that's an early example of an expert system back in the day. Uh, I remember that very well back when that was, was uh, introduced. Quite an interesting thing. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Great talk. Oh, it's thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Franco, go ahead. You got to unmute, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, a, a very interesting conversation, and uh, thank you for the for the for the group. I I, I think that. Uh, I, I wanted to say something about the expert system because uh, I started with the uh, with the expert system too, and uh, I I think after all in my simple mind expert system are also part of the AI portfolio of, of uh, as a technology. In, in the recent um, evolution, uh, some of the expert system evolved into fuzzy trees. And now there are self-learning fuzzy trees that can adapt to the uh, to the environment and the data. So it, one of the worst part of the the, the machine, the, let's say the uh, expert system, was that the learning part was not so well understood. What was uh, the data were not available like today, and there were no algorithm at that time to make it the algorithm learn. Now with the genetic, mixing the genetic algorithm and the fuzzy trees, they, they, uh, they, are, they can generate dynamic fuzzy tree that can learn. That's, that's as a data point. Excellent point. That's, that's very true. There's every year we have more 
yeah. processing capability, more memory, more space. And, and you're exactly right. And you brought up genetic algorithms. That's one of my favorite things to 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 stu study. It gets overlooked a lot, oh, yeah. you know. So it's a really cool uh, technique. Um, and what you do is you you're borrowing from from genes from from DNA. So you have mixing. So you take your problem space and you mix things up. You so you're you're crossbreeding and you allow for some level of mutation. You just randomly change, go in there and dork around with it. Uh, and then you make make all of these potential solutions sort of compete. So you have some sort of objective function or test. And then the top gets to stay and they get to go and breed again. And it's just, it's like having a little zoo. Um, and that's, no, that's yeah. so you bring that yeah, up and it's like, that's a, it's a much cheaper kind of way to, to and it gets through the search space very quickly. Very quickly. Yes. And in yeah. fact, I, I don't, I don't want to vouch for the genetic fuzzy tree because of, okay, so it's uh, it's my background, but uh, it, it, it's true that there are two benefits. The first one is that in theory, you, you don't need amount of data to learn because you can search the space solution much faster, as you said. And the other benefit is that uh, they, the solution that they can produce is, is what they call explainable because by design, you can test a fuzzy trees and at the end, if you stop learning, it's almost deterministic. So at that point, you have the benefit of both technologies. You have something that can learn, but once you stop learning, you can mathematically test the algorithm. So it's more, uh, so it, there are interesting facets also on the kind of technology. Yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. The there's a, a large amount of pressure, especially from regulators and like citizen groups to, to have explainable AI or explainable artificial intelligence. Because the process of, of machine learning or of AI of a lot of these models is opaque. In a genetic algorithm, like what we're, what we're talking about, um, you can actually, you have a record of how it came to that solution which is very human readable. You can just see, okay, you know, it's sort of like uh, getting a, a champion racehorse at the end of four or five generations of a breeding program. That's understandable. That's explainable. You can document that. It It is not possible to document some of the machine learning pr products. The number of variables buried in there, the hidden variables, especially with deep learning, is... Uh, it's it's not explainable as of today. Now there's lots of very smart people working on this, but it's a it draws a big distinction between things like expert systems and genetic algorithms and traditional searches and an AI ML. And this is this is something that I think for safety, if you want a reliable, safe AI in the future and you don't want it to take over your station and to kick you off the air, <laughs> you know, then, then we need to care. So this, we need to kind of uh, be aware and, and, um, and speak up and say that we expect these things to, to be safe. Um, another safety sort of offer uh, from, from a lot of the, the companies and a lot of the implemented systems is the requirement for what they call human in the loop. That, mm -hmm. okay, fine, we'll have a, an AI ML system running the cellular phone you know, uh, system for Chicago. Let's just say we're gonna we're gonna turn over configuration of all the five G system to to AI ML. Now, what if the AI ML figures out that poor people are not a good bet, and it just simply doesn't serve communities below a certain income level? Because why bother? Well, that is it goes directly against the FCC wanting to make communications, um, you know, bring communication the Communications Act, right? money, right? I mean, once you kind of mix in uh, making money, you can see that these decisions may not be very obvious, but over time, it's like, huh, wow, revenue's way up, but usage map shows only rich people talking on the on the phone. So an example like that is is why we, we have so much uh, attention paid to like safe AI, safe ML, and why a lot of people say, well, just put a human in the loop, just have a person check on it, run the results by them. 
Now, this, this works at a kind of a macro level. If you drop in every day and you monitor the system to make sure that nothing illegal or unethical or fattening is going on, okay, great. In some systems, a human in the loop or HIL will actually achieve a good result. You, you have somebody that can say, hey, wait, um, you know, the AIML that's running the dam is about to release, you know, a billion gallons of water and flood a town and because it thinks that the weather is going to get bad over the next year and it needs more space. And, you know, so a human can spot things like this. But for AIML that's running things where there's a huge number of variables, a human can't keep up. So once you make a system too complicated for a human to configure, it's too complicated for a human to control, even with a lot of assistance. So it's another area where there's lots of regulatory attention. And uh, I don't see how it can't eventually affect us because these sorts of issues will start to to really put a lot of pressure on spectrum usage. And if we want to keep enjoying our hobby, then we're going to have to care about these these sorts of things. We need the three laws of robotics. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there, at uh, the last session for TAC, uh, the AI ML working group talked about, they spent weeks talking about an AI bill of rights. Um, so not necessarily the artificial intelligence having rights, we're talking about the, the consumers, the that you should have a bill of rights. And, and we talked about things like uh, you need to be informed when you are being, um, when you're, you, when judgments or decisions are being made about you by a machine that that you should have the right to know when your cable bill or cell bill or or decision about your billing or your service is made in an automated fashion that you should be informed and just that one discussion alone took took a, a lot of effort and a lot of, of weeks to kind of work out and we ended up not coming to an agreement there was a lot of disagreement about this um you know, and so that's the sort of things that that are being talked about at the FCC, and they're also being talked about at the White House. The White House came out, I guess, it's now been two years with a big blueprint for AI regulation, very readable, more than a hundred pages worth of thoughts. The Federal Trade Commission is also diving into this. Uh, the State Department, as you saw in chat, uh, so it's all over the place, and a lot of these plans and. Uh, and regulatory proposals conflict with each other. So this is a an exciting time to be caring about things like dynamic spectrum allocation, which will require machine learning to pull off. Um, and I, I mean, if you care about the sort of the commercial versus amateur uh, spectrum usage uh, and in incursions, uh, then AIML is driving a lot of that. Okay, Jean, uh, you had your hand up there for quite a while. You want to come on? Yeah, I'm, I'm back. Sorry, folks. Um, we've been talking a lot about regulatory issues with this, primarily at the federal government level. But with regulations come enforcement. You mentioned a couple of areas of FCC and what I think uh, State Department. But who has the authority to actually enforce violations of AFI, A A I'm sorry, AI, and does one, if there's a competing organizations, who trumps whom at this present time? That's a really good question. I and I'm gonna give you my opinion and the reason why we have not seen any major regulatory package for AI come come out is because of the lack of the ability to to enforce and the questions of who has authority over what like the FCC has a particular mandate and the problems that we're talking about are because this is such a fundamental shift in technology it's very very disruptive very powerful you've heard all sorts of stories tonight it crosses completely over all the different agencies. And so each one has their small mandate and they're gonna just grapple with a little tiny part of it. It's like that story about the the blind men that all walk up to an elephant and they all have a completely different view on what, they, what they're coming to grips with. And that's what's going on right now. So 
we're in a big shift. It's a big tech technology shift. It's a there's a, a and then and there's obvious needs to to have safe, uh, safe consumer, you know, uh, or safe communications. You know, commercial communications needs to be safe for people to use, and it needs to be equitable. That's that's the law. And ensuring that in with with a use of AI ML is going to be uh, hard. So, I think I think you hit the nail on the head with the enforcement, and that came up a lot at the in, in the working group for AI ML at the FCC. We're going to need AI to watch over the AI. <laughs> it's going to be AI all the way down. <laughs> well, it's it's the old Latin phrase, and who will guard the guards? You know, so that's that's to, uh, that. That phrase is still very apt. That's uh, yeah. John from, John from Washington says he asked Chat GPT about the laws of robotics and pretended not to know anything about them. <laughs> okay, that's uh, got to be an Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we've been now in this thing for an hour and a half. Uh, we can keep going. Well, uh, we can have, have we can have another session too. So I yes. I think there's there's so much to talk about here, and it'd be really great to have some practical sort of uh, machine learning and AI in your in your shack, you know, or uh, in your radio. Um, I'd I'd really like to see that happen. So we we can we can talk again in in the near future about this. Okay, we look forward to that. This has been a great presentation. Thanks for everybody for coming and their input into this thing to make it what it was. Yes. Unless yeah. We, unless yeah. We... It's a real joy to 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 be part of this. Thank you to Dan and all of the planning committee and all of the wonderful people that shared their their thoughts and questions and achievements. Um, it's been a, a real honor to to do this. I look forward to the to the next one. We do too, <laughs> pretty much. So, okay. With that, I'm going to pull the plug unless we have somebody last minute wants something. <laughs>